making virtual, and we could tease that sentence apart. So we'll have a more um, kind of grand exploration of these concepts and human perception and human experience and the items you wrote about. Then we're gonna get much more tactical because Deepak has launched a number of interesting technologies and apps and VR experiences and AI assistance. And we have with us the people from his team who've built those. And we're gonna talk about how they're using VR and AI to help people manage various medical conditions or achieve a sense of wellness or mindfulness. Um, then we'll have um, time for Q&A and then the last approximately half hour we'll devote to your projects and doing some reviews of your classmates work. Um, I also, you may notice if you look around the, the group of squares here, um, we have a number of guests. Um, Deepak has a number of colleagues who he thought it would be fun to invite to sit in on this session. So if you see a more crowded room today, many of these people work with Deepak and his foundation in various capacities. And we can um, send you some introductions later if you want. But for now, um, just didn't want you to be alarmed if you saw lots of strange new squares. We're delighted to have everybody here. Um, we're also going to record this for Deepak's archives. I won't publish this for the public. Um, if any of you want to review a copy later, I can make a, a private copy available to you. But just so you know, if you're um, asking questions and answers, we are keeping a recording of this. So with that, let me talk about your homework assignments. As you know, you were asked um, questions that you're typically not asked in MIT classes. Um, and Deepak came up with these questions. You're all familiar with them. Um, I'm going to publish everybody's answers. I'm taking your names off of them awesome. and I'll put them all on our Google Classroom site. I would love for you to read what everyone wrote. It's really fascinating to look at the range of responses. I'm gonna pick on two of you right now though. And I've already spoken to you too, and you've given me permission to use your name. One of them is Yu Hao, um, who, when asking what the body is made of, um, well, I'll just pause and let you read this because it's, it's pretty well written. And Deepak's going to talk about these in a moment. Um, what's the universe made of? The positive energy and the negative energy. I don't know if they sum up to zero, but at least it should be constant. What is matter? an illusionary volumetric container of energy. Um, do human constructs and stories hold the universe together? And Yuhal said no. And you can read her rationale. So again, um, this was one of, uh, there were, all of you had really insightful and interesting and different responses. Um, I just thought it'd be fun to warm up Deepak's talk by showing a couple of them. Here's Shreya's, um, and I'll leave this up and let you read it. What's the universe made of? Um, well, strictly speaking, atoms, but the atoms don't mean anything without humans, or do they? We can debate that. And Sreya points out that it is our experience and our constructs that characterize the constructions of atoms. So we're the ones making the reality. Um, what is matter? Matter itself is just atoms. And then she goes on to cite physics. I'll leave this up and let you read it. And then do human, do human constructs and stories hold the universe together? And uh, Shreya pointed out Deepak's writings that everything is mind made regardless of the physical world. But this, this sentence even suggests that there is a physical world um, or that at least we have some concept in the mind of what a physical world is. So again, I don't wanna go into these in too much depth. I just wanted to give you a teaser and invite you to go read all of your classmates' responses, which will be up as soon as class is over. Um, and I've sent all of these to Deepak in advance. Um, he's already read them and loved them. Um, and we've talked about these two in particular. So with that as sort of a warm up of where you guys are, um, I, I now have the great honor of introducing Dr. Deepak Chopra. So I'm going to unshare my screen and I believe you're going to share yours, right?
Right. See if they can see it. Can you ask them? Um, first of all, Ken, can you see the slide? The first I certainly slide? can. Looks good. And can you see me yet? Yes, indeed. Okay, because I can't see myself. That's fine. Okay, first of all, thank you, Ken, for inviting me. And I feel very privileged to be with all of you uh, students uh, at MIT and some guest students from Harvard and all my friends and colleagues that are in this classroom. Thank you for joining us. I was very taken by all the answers that came from the students. And I have to say that they all, all of them make sense, which also uh, tells us how little we know about reality. Um, but nevertheless, today is a very good topic for us to explore. As you know, right now, the world seems to be in crisis with uh, eco-destruction, extinction of species, mechanized ways of killing each other and ourselves, from nuclear bombs to cyber warfare to all kinds of atrocious acts happening out there, and um, climate change and a pandemic going on. We certainly need to, I think, in my opinion, dream up uh, a new dream. So I'll start with a quote from, uh, I think it was, um, it was the philosopher Wittgenstein who said, we are asleep, our life is a dream, but once in a while we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. And to all my colleagues and friends today, I would say that this is time to wake up to reality because if we don't, it looks like we are headed in the direction of collective suicide or even possible extinction with all that is happening in the world right now and the chaos there. So today's topic, virtual reality and the future of planetary evolution. And I'll start with uh, my first slide, which uh, should be up momentarily uh, right here. So this is a special section of the journal Science or the magazine Science. Hasn't changed since 2005. Um, and in that particular issue of Science Magazine, there were 125 open questions in science. The first open question in science is, what is the universe made of? And uh, we'll see that uh, the only thing that people agree upon uh, as an answer to that is uh, one of two options. One is we don't know what the universe is made of. And the second option is it's made of nothing, which of course then raises the obvious question, why does it look like everything if it's made of nothing? The second open question in science in the same issue of Science Magazine is what is the biological basis of a consciousness? In other words, how does the brain produce uh, thoughts or feelings or sensations or imagination or insight or inspiration or creativity or a higher vision or ideological conflicts, all of that. In other words, how does matter in the brain produce experience in the mind and also in what we call consciousness? So as we look at these questions, and there are about 125 of these and they're all apparently equally important and unknown, but these are the first two. So if you look at this, um, these two questions, my first uh, reaction is, what if the question itself is incorrect? Then the answer could be misleading. And what if the universe is indeed made of nothing? And what if there is no biological basis of consciousness? What if? So I'm not asking you right now to agree with me, but to reflect on these questions because the answers you gave, all the students gave, actually all of them make sense through a particular worldview or through a particular cognitive or perceptual window. But having said that, let's look at how humans have given story to what we can call the experience of the universe. 
over the last 30, 40,000 years. So as you probably know, um, uh, historians tell us, deep historians tell us, that there was something called the cognitive revolution that occurred about 30,000 years ago. And until about 30,000 years, uh, there were probably eight different types of humans. So we call ourselves Homo sapiens, uh, which, by the way, means the wise ones, the reflective ones. Obviously, we were either arrogant enough, had enough hubris, or perhaps enough humility to give us that name, ourselves that name, Homo sapiens, the thinking ones. Um, but we gave names to other species of humans as well, Homo neanderthals, Homo floruensis, um, all kinds of other human beings, but they were part of the human family, not the same species, eight different species. And then one species, us, we developed a language for telling stories. No other species um, had this uh, capacity, apparently, in evolution, except Homo sapiens, and as soon as we developed the capacity for stories, apparently the first stories were gossip, and then there were other stories, and uh, as soon as we developed the capacity to give meaning and story to an experience, basically humans took over the, the world, humans took over the planet. Uh, and everything became a story. Money is a story. Wall Street is a story. Nation states are a story. Democracy is a story. Latitude is a story. Longitude is a story. Greenwich Mean Time is a story. These are human stories uh, that uh, we all agree upon that uh, make our experience possible and also um, actually help us ex communicate our experiences to each other. So this is a pretty good map of how humans have viewed the universe. I mentioned earlier that the cognitive revolution occurred about 30,000 years ago. The agricultural revolution occurred only about 12,000 years ago when people started to uh, grow food and also domesticate animals. And then only about 400 years ago, we saw the emergence of what we call the scientific revolution. And then things evolved very rapidly as far as the human experience is concerned. But this is a, a slide that shows you uh, basically how uh, humans have viewed the universe, divine universe, classic universe, relativistic universe, quantum universe, human universe, virtual universe. And I will very quickly explore these. But this is right now a slide that I borrowed from my friend Joel Premack who actually is one of the authors of what is called the double dark theory of the universe, both dark matter and dark energy. The, why, the reason why we are still looking for answers nature of the, or to the nature of the universe is this pyramid. 70% uh, of the universe is a mysterious entity called dark energy. It's not the usual energy we think of when we say mass is equal to energy in Einstein's equations. It's an anti-gravity force, uh, also referred to as the cosmological constant, um, uh, which was a term coined by Einstein. Uh, and this force is moving the space between galaxies as we speak right now faster than the speed of light. So as we speak right now, galaxies are tumbling across the cosmic horizon, which is about 47 billion light years away from where you and I sit approximately. And ga galaxies are tumbling across that cosmic horizon into what we can only call the unknowable, only call the unknowable, because by the time light gets from there to here, our particular solar system will have exhausted its thermonuclear energy and, and uh, basically disappeared into the heat death of absolute zero. So 70% is this unknown entity. 25% is another unknown entity called dark matter. And dark matter is so-called because it's invisible. 
we cannot see it. And the reason we cannot see it, it is not made of atoms. It doesn't reflect light, absorb light, emit light, or have any interaction with light. So we can only interact with atomic matter because we are made of atoms. So it's unlikely that we'll find out what that dark matter is, although there are attempts right now to identify something called WIMPs, weakly interactive massive particles. And many people are looking for them. Uh, right now, there's uh, no sight of them at the moment. 4% uh, of the universe is made of invisible atoms, interstellar dust. And uh, the rest uh, is uh, mostly hydrogen and helium, even as interstellar dust. So the visible universe, which is 2 trillion galaxies, we are told at the moment, 2 trillion galaxies, 700 sextillion stars, uncountable trillions of planets, is 0.01% of what's presumably out there. Atomic universe is 0.01% of the visible universe. The problem with the atomic universe, of course, is that atoms are also made of particles that are moving at lightning speeds around huge empty spaces. And when these particles are not being observed, they turn into what are called wavicles, which have neither units of mass nor energy. And uh, wavicles don't occupy locations in space-time. So what is the universe made of? Bottom line, we don't know nothing. But And there are many other current uh, conundrums with cosmo cos current cosmology leading us to doubt whether the standard model of physics actually is the complete model. And most physicists do believe that it is not. So very quickly, I want to, because this is not a class on physics, but on virtual reality and what it means for us. I'm going to run through the remaining slides about the history of the universe or the human rendition of the history of the universe very fast. Okay, divine universe, the classic universe, Isaac Newton, uh, again, other luminaries at that time, including philosophers like Rene Descartes and Leibniz and Spinoza and defining the classic laws of physics that nobody argues about. The same classic laws of physics have been used to land people on the moon and send uh, rockets into interstellar space. And then, of course, we have the relativistic universe through so Einstein, both the special theory and the grand uh, general theory, uh, which are two very different theories. And in fact, the special theory of relativity is now used for navigation and many other things, as is the general theory of relativity. And then um, this led to a more uh, dynamic interpretation of the universe, that it is actually woven into um, the experience of space-time and matter, where we see the theater of space-time and causality with material objects interacting with each other through the laws of motion and biological organisms orchestrating their own motion independently. And then we had the quantum universe with all these great luminaries and quantum mechanics, which has its own set of rules, very different from the set of rules of classical physics. None of what I'm saying here at the moment is controversial and is easily available knowledge on Google or Wikipedia, for that matter. So if you look at the uh, uh, attempts to understand quantum mechanics on Wikipedia, you'll see so many theories. And uh, these theories have to do with the interpretation of quantum mechanics, not with the mathematics of quantum mechanics, which everybody agrees works and is responsible for um, the major technology of our times especially the technology that we are going to be speaking about. Of the 20 plus interpretations of quantum mechanics, uh, two are most popular. The first is the Copenhagen interpretation, which required the presence of consciousness to understand um, reality. Uh, until recently, the Copenhagen interpretation was the most popular. Now it has been taken over by many worlds, meta worlds, 
uh, have gained popularity. If you read uh, Sean, um, what's his name? Um, um, I'm thinking of the professor at Caltech who just wrote a book called Something Deeply Hidden. Uh, the name will come to me in a moment. It's uh, hiding somewhere in my consciousness. Sean Carroll, Professor Sean Carroll, um, he says that there are infinite, probably infinite universes with infinite versions of you and me as well in right now in virtual reality. But that's another story. Um, and these are some of the other um, possible uh, interpretations leading us to a place where we actually uh, do not understand uh, what is really going on behind the scenes, so to speak. We make interpretations, we come up with theories, but at this moment, uh, we do not understand uh, either what the universe is made of or what the biological basis of consciousness is, if any. So today, I'm going to share with you something that a few uh, thinkers are talking about. If you want to uh, explore this a little more, I would recommend that you look at the work of Don Hoffman at the University of California in Irvine. And Don Hoffman is a physicist, but also a cognitive scientist and a neuroscientist and a mathematician. And Don Hoffman worked with uh, Crick. Watson and Crick fame. Crick was, of course, you know, won the Nobel Prize for, along with Watson, uh, for co discovering uh, uh, DNA, although the credit should have also gone to the woman colleague, Franklin. But in any case, these are very famous people who believed that the brain was the secret to consciousness. And Don worked with Crick for many years till he changed his mind that. Uh, the brain is the source of all experience. So uh, if you want to read uh, Don Hoffman's work, uh, please uh, pick up his latest book called The Case Against Reality. And basically what he and many other co cognitive scientists are saying is that perceptual reality is a magical lie. That uh, what we see is not what is. Um, my senses tell me that the earth is flat. Nobody believes that anymore. My senses give me the experience that the ground I'm standing on is stationary and I know it's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour. And my senses tell me that this bottle that I have in my hand is, uh, is solid and has a certain color, a certain feel, a certain uh, smell. And uh, all of that is a magical lie. And so I want to show you this next slide, uh, which uh, suggests that our experience of everyday reality is indeed an illusion, a simulation, a projection, a virtual reality projected by human consciousness. Of course, there are species have different experiences in whom their virtual reality would be totally different. What does the world look like to an insect with a hundred eyes? What does the experience of the world uh, feel to a bat that echo that navigates experience through the echo of ultrasound? What is uh, reality to a snake that navigates experience through infrared? So I also wanted to share this quote uh, from NASA, which I received many years ago. And it says, consider that you can see less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum here less than 1% of the acoustic spectrum. And as you read this, you are traveling at 220 kilometers a second across the galaxy, that 90% of the cells in your body carry their own microbial DNA and are not you because they are microbes. And the atoms in your body originated in the belly of a star. The atoms in your body are 99.999% empty space. And uh, um, None of the atoms you're, you have in your body that you're using right now, none of the atoms in your brain uh, were the ones that you were born with. You have 46 chromosomes, two less than the common potato. The existence of the rainbow depends on the conical receptors in your eyes. And to animals without cones, the rainbow doesn't exist. So you don't just look at a rainbow, you create it. This is pretty amazing, especially considering 
that all the beautiful colors you see represent less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum. So my friends, already we can see that perceptual reality is a magical lie, but what I want to share with you is that even this explanation, which seems so amazing um, and clear, is a magical lie. So let's explore this together. Because what we are saying right now is that to observe is to construct. And so what we call perceptual experience is a constructed reality. The fact is, if we were, if I were to ask you, what is everyday experience? What is the everyday experience to any biological organism, uh, or especially to the human biological organism, that has not yet bought into a story about reality? What is perceptual experience to a baby, for example, or a child? It's a collection of sensations, sensations, sense perceptions, images, feelings, and as the child learns language, also what we call thought. Thought is giving meaning to sensations. And by sensations, I mean anything that is a sensation. Even a thought is a sensation. An image is a sensation that appears on the screen of consciousness. Any sensation given meaning becomes constructed perceptual reality, including the perceptual reality of that which we call the human body because the human body is not a noun, it's a verb. It started as a fertilized ovum, it'll end in death and everything in between. An activity uh, that is known to us as humans in human consciousness as a intermittent stream of sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. That's all we experience. Then we give meaning, interpretation to that, and we construct our experience of reality. So let me share with you a couple of slides to illustrate this. Right now, what you're seeing is a bunch of colors. And that's all you see. If a baby was looking at this, that's all the baby would see. Of course, this is a peculiarly hu human experience. I don't know what this picture, if we can call it a picture, would look like to even your dog or uh, certainly to an insect with multiple eyes or uh, another species uh, such as an elephant that navigates experience through infrasonic or whatever. But right now, visually, what you're seeing is a bunch of colors. Now, you can give it two meanings in here. One would be uh, two horses against the backdrop, backdrop of sky and mountain and uh, twilight or sunlight, uh, sunset, or you could see a woman with beautiful locks of hair. Which one is it? Well, before you interpret, before you give meaning, it's either or it's neither, and it could be actually subject to many interpretations. You're looking at that picture, you immediately construct the meaning, which then becomes your perceptual reality which then you call everyday reality. This is true of every experience we have. I'm just using the visual experience right now, but this is true of any sensation. Sensation of a human skin is very different from sensation of a crocodile skin or a sensation that an insect would feel or a honeybee would feel. In other words, in every act of perception, you and I are constructing our reality. Right now, you could see a skull, you could see a young woman uh, in front of a drawer with lots of makeup, etc., uh, a mirror in front of her. Uh, but in reality, all that is being uh, projected from human consciousness right now is a modified form of experience that we call visual experience. And visual experience only occurs in the form of colors, shapes, and forms, period. Human visual experience only occurs in the form of colors, shapes, and forms. The rest is a human story. Which leads me to this beautiful slide, uh, uh, which uh, you could interpret as either a face or you could interpret it as uh, a word, liar. Uh, which one is it? I inserted this slide because of your beautiful poem of William Blake who said, we are led to believe a lie when we see with 
and not through the eye that was born in the night to perish in the night while the soul slept in beams of light. Okay, so now, uh, my dear friends, I want you to stare at uh, this girl's nose. And if you look at this girl's nose, there are about five dots there. Stare, uh, stare at them without blinking your eyes. And we won't wait 30 seconds. That's too much in modern times, which are always rushed. So uh, let's stare at those four dots for about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And now just shift your gaze to the ceiling or any white surface and see what happens. You're projecting and constructing another image. Next slide. And here we see another famous uh, diagram that I came across uh, many years ago. So stare at the four dots in the middle of this picture, the four dots right in the middle where the nose would be for about 10, 15 seconds. And now without blinking your eyes, keep staring. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Look at the white part of the screen and see what you're projecting. See what you're constructing. I'll leave it up to you. So given that, I have to conclude today's conversation with this fundamental idea that the human body and the physical world are sensations given meaning. And those sensations occur in consciousness. And that consciousness therefore conceives, constructs, governs, and becomes the physical universe. That the ontological primitive of the universe is not matter. In fact, matter itself is a human construct an interpretation of human sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, and perceptions, given a storyline, given meaning. And I've used that understanding to tackle the seven pillars of well-being, which are crucial because our body is the cognitive and perceptual instrument that gives us the experience of what we call reality. And so these seven pillars of well-being are now known to affect almost every chronic disease. All, less than 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant. The rest are dependent on lifestyle. In other words, the future of well-being is preventable, predictable, participatory, process-oriented, but also personalized because it has to be personalized according to your experience of everyday reality. These seven pillars of well-being, the first six have to do with biology and the seventh has to do with consciousness or ultimate reality. So with, given that, we've created new algorithms correlating emotional, mental and physical well-being. And these algorithms now are being used for, by our Chopra Foundation to create emergent technologies. Can we create a world where through VR, artificial intelligence, and everything we understand about the convergence of new technologies, can we in fact create the experience of a joyful, energetic body, loving, compassionate heart, reflective mind, and lightness of being, which would be a state of perfect health? Can we create algorithms that correlate everything from dreams to digestive function, to fine tuning of hormones, to what is happening in the body and other measures such as breathing rate, eye movements, reflective alert mind mirrored as facial expressions, uh, micro expressions, tone of voice, heart rate variability with a deeper understanding of the convergence of these technologies. So the practical applications become huge, health, well-being, biometrics, and all the measures that you see here, but also rethinking the future of humanity. As we look at the future of humanity, these become the five foundational principles, collaborative creativity through information networks, clean energy harnessed through new technologies, a revolution in transport systems, uh, including teleportation in the future, food as software, and moving away from a world of cold steel, oil, livestock, concrete toward a world 
toward a world trans protons and qubits and wavicles. This last site, Rethinking Humanity, this paper is being put together, has been put together um, by two social scientists, and we are hoping to collaborate with them and many others to see the future of emergence from invisible to visible, from nothing to everything, from inequity and predatory competition to shared prosperity and collaboration, and ultimately creative freedom and convergence of technologies to create a more peaceful, just, uh, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. And that would ultimately be our new virtual universe, the extension of the virtual reality that we're already in. So with that, I'd like to turn over, and I want to show you this slide because I don't want you to think I'm just shooting the breeze by myself. This is the current conversation in science, and all of this is very relevant as we embark on the future of well-being, both uh, human well-being, but planetary well-being as well. So with that, I'm going to invite the CEO of the Chopra Foundation, Punacha Machaya, who is very well-versed, very well-versed in the under deeper understanding of consciousness, but also technology, to show you some of the uh, projects with, that we at the Chopra Center are involved with in collaborative uh, technologies for creating a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. I want to remind you that uh, I'm in a studio and observing all precautions, as is my colleague, uh, uh, Puna Chamachaya, as well. So over to CEO of Chopra Foundation, Puna Chamachaya. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to continue Dr. Chopra's presentation. I think everything has been teed up. So hopefully you all can hear me okay. Okay. Can you hear yes. me okay? Yes. Can you see my slide? Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. We are never done this kind of a virtual technology demo, but these are interesting times. But what I'm going to showcase over the next 30 minutes is going to take you all through a story of technology of how we at the Chopra Foundation have been continuously curating technology over the years and basically spur imagination among your students. I know a very diverse background from Harvard, MIT, and Berkeley uh, School of Music to kind of really uh, look at how can we solve well-being uh, around the world. So Ken, let me know if, you're not, if you have any issues with the sound or things like that, because I'm also sharing uh, videos as I speak. So, so what far, I'm gonna good, do thanks. Is, wonderful. So I'm gonna take you through uh, a chronology starting with holopresence, which is uh, telepresence, uh, two-dimensional videos being projected through 3D holograms, through one-on-one -on -one meditations, all the way up to a digital twin using Deepak Chopra. So uh, that's kind of the next 30-minute journey. So what I'm going to first start off with holopresence. So about six um, years Tuna, ago- If I could just jump in, the only one thing I might tweak is there's a lot of black around that slide. I don't know if you can zoom and make your window a little bigger. Um, yeah, I want to use this more- yeah, more as a uh, talking point, and then I'm going to actually do a video. Okay. So this Bye. is more as just as a background. So in 2016, we started looking at this whole area of telepresence, or what we call holopresence. So how can Deepak be actually virtual and teleport himself across, you know, multiple parts of the world? And we actually worked with a company called Art Media to really create this, to work with them to kind of do this broadcast technology. So imagine sitting in San Diego, teleporting live. So this meeting could have happened over hollow presence. So Deepa could have been at MIT and having a live two-way conversation using camera technology. And this was a one-to-many, but using proprietary technology. And the technology we use is called art media. It's called hollow presence technology. And I'm really doing this because I wanted you all to also, the students be able to go and look at this technology. But after the meeting is over, Ken, I'll work with you to share the URLs, the links, and then from the Chopra Foundation side, we can collaborate and how the students can work with some of these technologies together. I'm gonna to play a video and let's see, this is gonna be the first test. So you see if y'all can hear, hear the sound okay. Hey Dave. Hey Vancouver, Hi. hey Kevin, how you doing? Is that yourself? <laughs> this is myself here <laughs> with you in Vancouver on stage. 
<laughs> Welcome. That's uh, it's great. It's great to see you. This, this this works out really well. Where are you? I am in Toronto, and we should tell your audience this isn't another one of those demos where I'm like not real. Yeah. I'm actually really here on stage with you in Vancouver as well. Wow! Wow! Well, it's, it's it's fantastic. You're looking well. <laughs> so, if you can, did there was a sound okay on that, Ken? Were you able to hear everything okay? Yes, very clear. Okay, good. So what, what was happening over here is that we had a camera set up remotely. We also had cameras set up in different locations. So now you can actually teleport yourself on an internet bandwidth network. So what we did in 2016, Deepak was actually on stage, full size, life size on screen, talking about you are the universe at the Sages and Scientists Symposium. And this is exactly the teleportation. This is a video thinking video. to myself, Galileo, Cop Copernicus, maybe even Einstein. I said, Krishu, how do you know all this? He said, it's on my Pokemon. And the reason I'm sharing this story. So if you just think of this video, actually Deepak is not live on stage. We actually teleported him live. And this was using, at that time, with the state-of-the-art holographic technology. But also what we did, we also used the same technology to curate panels. And this is an example of a live panel that I teleported myself in, in, in 3D and curated a panel remotely. From Comcast, we have Patty Barrett from Scripps Translational Research, Rick Stallmeyer, Upasna, and Jeffrey Martin. Oh, we have one more chair. Okay. I think I don't really belong anymore, so <laughs> <laughs> take my seat, Upasna. The reason I'm bringing this technology up is because this is the first time we actually showed a two-dimensional live stream using a digital virtual avatar where I was present remotely, could see everything happening at the, at the Beverly, Beverly Hills uh, Hotel, the Wilshire, and we actually curated an entire online panel uh, while we were online. Now all of us probably have one of these things on our person. It's a smartphone. And the so the next thing I want to talk about is where has the technology gone from there? Today, we are working with companies like Evercoast. Evercoast is based on New York, Ben Nunez. And uh, at, the, at the Impact Forum last year, we actually showed 3D hologram streaming. So we could now stream Deepak captured in 3D on any device, which was capable of projecting in 3D. And why is this important? Because based post-COVID, now we can do telepresence, live events, festivals, conferences, training and simulation using a hologram. And the technology we work with is this company called Evercoast, which does volumetric capture and live stream uh, online. And I want to show you how this technology has evolved. And this is a video of Deepak captured on a 3D hologram, which can then be presented. You can watch him at home on your living room table, or you could be on your 3D, which is capable of 3D. And now observe whatever is happening around you without judgment. Observe the sensations in your body. And now proceed with awareness and compassion. And this looks so simple, but what it's really doing is that we can technically, this entire on conversation right now, is it real? It is real because Ken said you have Deepak Chopra coming on stage, on, online, Punacha is going to be there. But technically, this entire experience could have been a virtual experience through AI and technology. What I'm going to show you is just a snippet of how this technology comes together using multiple cameras and streaming, because this will probably perk your imagination of the students to see what more can be done with this. Food. <laughs> 5G is about being able to do things that we can't currently do today. The idea behind it is to blend the digital world and the physical world together to experience a more holistic view of the Thanksgiving Day Parade. For the parade, we are capturing celebrity talent hosts and enabling them to teleport themselves into the live stream and be at the parade even though they weren't necessarily there. What we do is volumetric capture, which is about capturing humans and anything and turning them into a 3D object. All the different cameras that are involved with it. And so why is this relevant? So imagine today with the, with the 50 plus people today who are on this live stream, imagine we could have put a 3D hologram on your desk while Deepak spoke. Today, we're looking at a laptop and a screen, but in the future, we can project a 3D hologram of Deepak and we could have a live conversation. This is imagination of how 
we can now take this entire experience and project in 3D and volumetric capture and technology like 5G, the convergence is making this happen. So the next thing I'm gonna go into is going from this kind of experience of streaming to a VR personal experience. And this is something we worked with a company called Weaver in Venice Beach, where we kind of created a 3D one-on-one -on -one immersive experience of how Buddha got enlightenment under the, under the Bodhi tree. And what, what we're looking at this was actually with Oculus, but now imagine adding things like ECG, EEG, galvanic skin response, uh, using all the biofeedback to change the world. But what I'm gonna show you over here is the company. The company is called Weaver. Punacha, I just wanna yeah. emphasize something you said because you've worked on this for so long that you might take for granted that this is what you were doing. He just said he <laughs> wanted to create an experience of when Buddha achieved enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. And those of you who studied Buddhism know that that's quite a mouthful. And this is a, a very serious undertaking that they set out to create in VR. So this is this is really cool to, to watch. Thank you, Ken. I think also I, I, what I also want, want to say is that this is the narrative of storytelling and technology coming together, right? So immersive technology, immersive storytelling with real-time feedback. And I think we can recreate, I think uh, Deepak has really taken up on the thing, how do we create, bring Eastern wisdom tradition into the real life context and give you real time feedback. So this was our first attempt and we are continuing to improve on this technology as we speak. I'm gonna do that. I'm actually gonna show you the video uh, of, um, of the simulation because you, we're, not wearing, we're not wearing the Oculus Rift, but I'll just show you how this graphics was created. Experience right this moment, right now. It is your own being. It is your innermost being that is having the experience. Your true self. So what is important about this, if you were actually wearing the Oculus, if you had a 360 experience where you could kind of have an eyes open experience. So imagine I'm looking right now in keeping your eyes open and really exploring the space and really feeling, imagine if you could now take over your visual, your, your sense of uh, hearing. Imagine I could also spray some mist and give you the smell of being in the forest. Now if you take over all the five senses and Deepak spoke about sift, sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. Now using VR, I, we can literally transport you as being under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya, right? So that kind of was the experience of doing this med meditation. And I, we are working on a lot more things over here, but I want to kind of just give you a sneak preview. So that was something we did with Weaver. And now what we're really excited about to see some of the work uh, through Bruce Wan and the Dreamscape VR, where they're really taking this one-on-one -on -one experience wearing the Oculus Rift into a six-person experience. We actually feel your body you really feel that you're in a shared space. So what we're calling this shared collaborative VR experience. So the company we are collaborating with over here is Dreamscape. And um, I would, you know, once again, uh, after this, I'll actually connect you all up uh, through, through Ken. What I want to show you all is a trailer, which will kind of give you this experience of a shared collaborative VR experience, where you feel you're not alone, but you're there with six other people exploring a space together. And this opens up a lot of possibilities, especially in training and education. There's a pot of whales that needs our help.
So what this really, uh, I think, opens up for, I think, especially students at MIT and Berkeley School of Music, and imagine bringing virtual worlds in a collaborative shared experience. And I think especially today with the convergence of uh, especially reviewing technologies, uh, different uh, sensors and biofeedback, and a 5G, very powerful network, we can really bring about this collaborative viewing. Next up, what I want to show is, um, can I show the next thing? If you click on more, you can hide floating. <laughs> I'm doing, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Uh, I'm actually showing how, how you can use smart glass. Right, so you're showing I can click on more, there you go. Yeah, so smart glass. So now we were kind of tethered to wearing a glass or using a screen. Imagine if every surface is a projection screen. I think I saw Piers from VIEW uh, on, on this particular class. I think he's uh, signed on. But we're working with a company called VIEW and we actually, we, this is at the Impact Forum in Lake Nona. For every surface, imagine your windows can now become a projection screen. And the technology here is called VIEW, and uh, we are really excited to collaborate with them. And what I want to show is put together for the, for the conference here at IoT. Hello, I'm Rao Mulpuri, and along with my colleagues, over the last 12 years, we've been building VIEW to transform the day-to-day -day window. The smart window controls heat and glare, eliminates blinds and shades, and provides view and natural light all the time. Because we have a highly connected system, we're able to bring a whole host of smart building applications. For example, this video you're watching is coming to you through the View Smart Display, which is a high definition display that's installed right into the window. Also on this platform, we have a sensor array that has a number of environmental sensors. And these can be used in order to control the environment precisely for the health and wellness of the people. These new applications transform buildings into living spaces that help us engage, interact, and communicate with each other. The buildings will be transformed into high-speed 5G cell towers with complete wireless coverage. Now that the blinds are lifted, these humanized spaces will keep us entertained while keeping us connected to natural light and views of the outdoors. And we're just getting started. So why is this important? Because what this does, it eliminates this restriction of, you can be at home, at work, on the road, use any space, any, any window as a projection medium. So I'm not tethered to my laptop or my cell phone or anything else. So it's, oh, this opens up the possibility of really recreating different realities. So another thing which I'm gonna show you is, so we went from holopresence, holo telepresence to holograms to using any uh, using collaborative VR uh, to also using any projection screen. This is something I'm personally very passionate about working on is I'm working very closely with the, the Glass Enterprise, which is Google, and looking at how we can use your, uh, your Google Glass, the Glass screen to project what we call assisted reality. Imagine I'm a first line, I'm an emergency worker. I have somebody who came in with a mental health condition. I need to call a psychiatrist. I can now use the projection in my glass to do a remote, remote, view, remote conversation with an expert, project it onto my screen, get the feedback. But more importantly, this is for students at MIT, you're all experts in camera. Imagine I can use this eight megapixel camera to now look at somebody's facial expression, look at the, the capillary blood flow, look at the heart rate, heart rate variability. And this is a company called Bina.ai, which is using camera technology, but this can be integrated into smart glass. And this is an example of how we're using Google Glass as an endpoint to kind of bring about this innovation. So this is, once again, uh, showing how we're using reality, different types of technologies from VR, AR. This is what we call assisted reality. Right? The next thing I'm going to talk about is um, we are moving into this convergence. So until now, we saw a lot of different technologies. But what's, what's next? I believe what Deepak said was, with the, with the rise of sensors, sensors being basically pervasive everywhere, what we call now today is the age of um, a, a basically computing anywhere, right? So basically it's going to disappear. So you can wear wearable computing on your shirts, stretchable electronics. So EEG, ECG, galvanic skin response, heart rate, heart rate variability, the gyro sensors, camera sensors, they can all be embedded into what we call ambient computing everywhere. It's pervasive. What I want to Shaila highlight is something which we're working with um, Professor uh, Dr. Ricardo Gilda Costa, who's actually logged in today, who was in, in uh, Portugal, 
He was actually in San Diego, the SOC Institute. He's come up with a wearable EEG sensor, which can be put on your forehead. But what it can also do, it can be kind of in, tied into your Oculus Rift. So what it does, now based on how you feel, imagine we talk about flow states or being calm and relaxed. Imagine if you're meditating and based on how you feel, the grass turns from, from brown to green, or if you get stressed, it goes back into green. And this is the whole area, it opens up this, this whole area called BCI, brain computer interface. So the interface disappears You're using brain control to control the interface. And this is really important as, as you start getting into virtual worlds and virtual reality. And he's done a lot of work with Marvel, with Iron Man and things like that. What I'm gonna show you is a demo of uh, the technology. It's actually, it's not, it's, it's not a demo, it's actually real technology, but I'm gonna show you a video. And following that, I'm gonna show you a, a kind of a demo of using apps, using what we call DigiCeuticals, which is an FDA cleared app. So the company here is, we are working very closely with, it's called Neuroverse. So Neuroverse has this thing called the brain station. There are multiple applications from mental performance to migraine prediction. But what I'm gonna show today is some work we did with them for the Lake Nona Impact Forum, where we actually did a VR, uh, 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 I would say real-time feedback of virtual worlds using Deepak's guided meditation, where somebody is using the, uh, the HTC and can actually manipulate the world using BCI. With your eyes closed, your back relatively upright, and your feet uncrossed. Keep your arms open in your lap, and close your eyes. For the next few minutes, approximately about four to five minutes, just observe your breath. Observe your breath. Okay, we'll do that for the next four minutes. I'll keep the time and then we will proceed. So what is happening right now? I, I just I was happy to see somebody from Unity uh, join the call. This is actually using the Unity engine uh, to kind of really render real-time 3D worlds based on the feedback from the EEG device, which is the brain station. So this opens up limitless possibilities, right? In healthcare, people are stressed, anxiety, phobias. We can now look at brain entrainment and look at how we can use VR technology to really address real-time applications in health and wellness world. I'm also going to show you an example, and you can see Ricardo is standing in this corner of the screen, and he's trying to control a virtual world using uh, basically the brain interface. The following sequence. This is an example how we can bridge the real and the virtual and using real-time sensor and feedback, we can kind of uh, bridge these technologies together. So as I look into the next thing we're working with, if we just announced this partnership with a company called Highmark Interactive, and this is basically the world's first FDA cleared gamified mobile uh, app for neurological assessment, looking at things like traumatic brain injury, stress, anxiety, sleep. What I'm gonna do is to just give you a quick uh, it's a one minute, 30 second uh, overview of the technology. Assessing brain performance has been impractical for most of us. Long waits to do monotonous testing. Until now, EQ Brain Performance is a mobile, game-based platform with FDA clearance, using clinically derived games to quickly test cognitive, visual, and balance function. It's for youth and for seniors, for athletes from amateur to elite, and for those who need to be on their game to start the day. EQ Brain Performance, assessing brains one game at a time. Assessing brain performance. Yeah, this is once again opening up the possibilities of, like Ricardo will talk about the P300 marker, looking at stress, anxiety, attention. So we can now look at gamification. Instead of getting a, a pharmaceutical, imagine digital therapeutics. This really opens up the world of connecting the virtual world and the digital world for health and wellness. So what I'm going to go next is really going to, uh, this is one of the core pillars of uh, something uh, Dr. Deepak Chopra, Gabriela Wright, and me are working on, which is mental health. Every 40 seconds, we lose somebody to suicide in the world, in this great country, every 12 minutes. And what we started this movement called Never Alone. 
So imagine, you know, in, in at a time when we are super connected, we have all the networks today, we are at an all time loneliness crisis. So what we are doing over here, we actually, if you go to neveralone.love, uh, that is our website, the Chopra Foundation for the Never Alone Movement, you will actually see a messenger pop up and the messenger is called PV, people interacting with intention. And this is a Facebook messenger. This is my, I'm actually scrolling my screen. It's actually showing me my conversation. I can see now, and it is actually happening in real time. So I'm going to do a text. I am stressed, right? And this can be on text and on chat. And it basically gives you a conversation. It says, hey, Punach, it's been a few hours. So I want to be sure how to continue. Should we finish our last conversation? Conversation? Yes. yes. And what it's doing now, you know, is PV real or is PV not real? From my perspective, it's as real as it is. I hear you. Having the right medical support system can make a huge difference. I am very... Tired. I am not sleeping. Right? What's happening over here? We are partnering with what we call emotional AI. So I'm not sleeping. I said that can be frustrating. It's crucial to have a support team. There are things we can do to get you the right support. Here is an example of an AI engine, which is what we call emotional AI, which is giving you real-time therapy online. And this is really our collaboration with a technology company called X2 AI, where we are taking the X2 AI platform. And what I want to show you, this is actually our real-time dashboard. We launched this for Mental Health Awareness Month. And if you look at the platform, we have over 1 million messages being exchanged right now on PV, right? 513,000 minutes on, on PV and almost we averted about 400 plus suicide attempts or suicide conditions which we have been intercepted using technology. Why am I showing you this? Because we are living at an age where no one should ever feel alone or lonely. And here as technologists, we can do our, our fair share. So this is an example of how we are using. Yeah, and we're also using the blockchain as part of this conversation. Deepak mentioned you work partnering with a company called Hedera Hashgraph. We are now putting all mental health content on the blockchain. We're also looking at how do we democratize health and well-being? So we're also working on a token called the Love in Action token, where we can incentivize people for health and wellness. Uh, this is going to be uh, a quick, I'm going to just go to a 30-second video. I have four minutes left uh, of how we use it. It's a great county with a large population of hardworking people that are in need of a lot of services. Natividad is a county hospital, safety net hospital. Uh, we're located in Salinas, California. We see artificial intelligence that's available in therapy, let it out. I thought, well, will our patient population be open to it? I honestly didn't think they would. It's completely the opposite. People are open to it. 80% are Spanish speakers. They're open and they're receptive to tests and that we all need help. Test really has a focus on mental health. So test really focuses on making people feel better whether that's because of depression, anxiety, or any other. So what I want to leave you all with is really this thing like we can use technology today to really understand who you are, deep personalization. And Deepak talks about the, the five Ps, right? The future of well-being is, is first of all predictable. If you can predict it, you can prevent it. To prevent, you need to personalize, you need a process, you need a platform, and most importantly, you need to get people to participate. Right. So moving on, um, this is really kind of culmination of all the different things we have shown you. Where are we today? Today, we are using the convergence of AI, uh, the different technologies of hologram, 3D, to really create what we call digital twins. We can now measure you at home, at work, on the road, at play. So Deepak is working with the AI Foundation to really look at his body of work. So imagine taking in 91 plus books, all the different content on the internet, really parsing all of it and then building kind of his digital twin and looking at AI technology to do that. So the web, website here is called digitaldeepak.ai. You can go to the website, you can sign up for the, for the trial. This is actually online right now. And what we can also do- By the do, way, um, Punacha, um, Carolyn got us codes. Everyone's gonna get a free sign-up code. You're gonna be able to go on and use this through December 31st. Perfect, yes, please go in there. And then you'll actually get to see the various technologies being played out. And what I'm going to show you right now is a snippet 
of a Wall Street Journal live, which happened a couple of weeks ago. It's really interesting because it actually shows the, 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 what is real. The real, the virtual, the digital is all kind of coming together, right? And just watch this for the next two minutes and that'll kind of bring him to the end of my conversation. All digital Deepak in. I think he's already uh, in the Zoom waiting room or maybe we should, he's got, he's got Zoom. Digital Deepak, are you there? Ah. Hi there. Hi, Digital Deepak. Thank you for joining us here at WSJ Tech Live. Of course. Digital Deepak, how are you doing today? I'm super. And you? Uh, not bad. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot under these lights, you know, and I, I could probably use a little bit of meditation, which we're gonna yeah. gonna get to. Uh, Digital Deepak, I have a couple of questions for you. Are you ready? Of course. Uh, Digital Deepak, what did you have for breakfast this morning? I don't eat, but the real Deepak usually eats yogurt with a little bit of honey and fruit for breakfast. Okay, all right. That's pretty close. That's pretty close, real Deepak. So what I want to leave you all with over here is that what we're seeing on this screen is kind of what's going to show the times to come, right? We have the real Deepak, Dr. Deepak Chopra. We have a third party conversation, Wall Street giant journalist. We have a digital twin all kind of coming together. Where this can go is infinite possibilities with technology. And that's really, I think our goal today was to stir uh, this imagination of how we can work together. And as you all go into your different respective fields of research, you can see the convergence of network technologies, material science, projection technologies, uh, networks, AI, all coming together to really create this digital twin so we can all have a better quality of life. So that's really everything I had to say today. And I'm going to stop my screen share and uh, bring Deepak back. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Poonacha. Um, I don't know if you noticed what was going on in the chat window, but during that part of the video where you showed the meditation, um, where Deepak was saying, you know, sit with your legs uncrossed and your back slightly upright, I felt myself relaxing just in those couple of seconds, even though I knew it was just a video demonstrating it. And some of the students wrote in the chat a petition to start every class with a meditation. And several people seconded it. I don't know if you're, you have the chat window open there. Some students will type questions in there. Um, so let's open up the floor now to discussion and questions. Um, type things in the chat or just unmute yourself and dive in, or you could use the raise hand feature and I'll call on I you. Would, I would suggest that the questions right now and the chat would be just with the MIT students and not with the guests at the moment, uh, just with the students, if that's okay. Right, and by that he meant the MIT, Harvard, and Berkeley students, because we have a number of friends Sorry. of Deepak yeah. and guests on the line. Yes, there. of course, of yes. course. There's uh, a letter. Uh, Althea, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. This is really amazing. Um, when you were talking about um, recording and these emotional AI support and recording them on the blockchain. I was wondering, how do you ensure people's privacy? Because obviously then on blockchain, everything's there, everything is like trackable, um, but do you encrypt it before it goes there? Or like, how do you think about privacy? Yeah, so we are working with Hedera Hashgraph, which is the leading distributed ledger. Every, all the privacy controls are with the user. So you get to set the level of transparency. Uh, we believe trust is the most important thing in any network. So trust is implicit. And that's the reason why we went with Hedera. So the company is called Hedera, H-E-D-E-R-A. And I will share all the links with uh, Ken after the meeting. Aleta, what you raised is a very important question in the whole virtual reality and AI field right now. And the AI foundation with whom we work, their number one concern is unethical uses and lack of privacy. So we are building into the AI system safeguards that it will always remain ethical. It's not like, you know, if you see deep fake videos, they can be faked, but the AI cannot be faked. 
if you have the right uh, algorithms. Thank you very much. Sure, Cameron, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for an incredibly enlightening presentation. Uh, it was just fantastic to watch. Uh, so many thoughts, but just one that comes to mind at the moment. I was in, really intrigued by the, the, if you like, the feedback of how you're using sensor technology to then uh, real-time alter the, your VR experience. Where, where do you see the future of effectively this, this personalization of a VR experience going in terms of the capability of VR adapting to that? I'll say a few things, but... Uh... Uh, then I'll ask Punacha to comment as well. You know, we use the word sensors all the time. Sensors, sensors, sensors. So what are we sensing? We are sensing sensations, whether they are, you know, and the expression today, you can go to your bank account and open it with facial recognition. All this controversy about voting, we should have had this technology. Imagine if you had facial recognition, voice recognition, you could vote safely from home, foolproof, there's no, um, there's no counterfeiting here. So th the way we are seeing right now, and the view is an example, is as soon as the sensor picks up something like heart rate variability is off or blood pressure is off or a breathing pattern is off, right then instantly, it can give you an intervention that will change that biological response like instantly. Uh, through a breathing exercise, for example, or through vagal stimulation. I don't know how many people know about the vagal stimulation. This is a big revolution right now happening in neuroscience that all the stress that we experience comes from what we call sympathetic overdrive, which is the fight flight inflammatory response. The opposite of that is vagal stimulation. So if you electrically stimulate the vagus nerve, and right now that's in, uh, uh, approved for say intractable epilepsy, but people who were using these devices, they found that other things were getting better. Arthritis was improving, asthma was improving. Basically what the vagus nerve does is it decreases inflammation in the body. It fine tunes the immune system. And anyone who knows yoga or breathing or pranayam, you know, yoga is now very popular. Everybody can see that that's what yoga does. That's what breathing exercises do. That's what actually body movements do. And different body movements do different branches of the vagus nerve. So it's not just yoga, it's tai chi, qigong, all these martial art techniques that can immediately, just a gesture, a hand movement, a breathing technique, a smile, and you'll see heart rate variability instantly changing. The more re we reinforce this, the more neuroplasticity occurs. And neuroplasticity is impossible unless there's genetic epigenetic modulation. So actually now these digital technologies are showing us that digital interventions can actually change not only gene expression, brain waves, reduce inflammation in the body through well-known techniques that have been practiced for thousands of years, but now we can actually instantly document their efficacy and actually imp uh, uh, help improve it. Any other comments? I think, Cameron, just to the point is that what we are building at the Chopra Foundation is what we call a life event ontology. Everybody has a model. We are very predictable as human beings. You probably do certain things with breakfast, lunch, dinner, at times irrational. So what we're doing is actually using all the ambient computing technologies, the GSR, heart rate, the pitch and standard deviation, the balance of your voice, micro expressions, and really creating a model of who is Cameron. At times, when you deviate from that model, we know there's something happening. Now we need insight. And this is where I think technology can go. We can now change the lighting. We can change the circuit lighting at home. We can change the, the television content. We can change the screen content. This is when, when insight comes to information is when transformation happens. And that's really where I think we are looking at at home, at work, at, at on the road, at play and creating a model of you so we can actually become your trusted advisor. So Digital Deepak, an example, could really become Cameron's friend, right? And if I realize all of a sudden Cameron sleeps six, sleep six hours a day, he's suddenly sleeping eight hours a day. Is it because he's tired or is it because he's stressed? And then Digital Deepak intervenes. Furthermore, then as down the road, Digital Cameron, Digital Lewis, Digital Emily, and they are all interacting with each other and evolving at the same time. And down the road, 
interacting with the grandchildren of the grandchildren of the grandchildren of your grandchildren and learning from them okay. and exchanging ideas. That's scary, <laughs> but, but um, important to think about. So um, we have a couple hands raised. Let's go to London and then Olivia after London. London, go ahead. Hi, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. I really love the topics you're talking about. One of the questions I've been thinking about recently, and I'm curious as to your opinion, is at what point the artificial intelligences we're creating start to have a story of their own that they can tell about their experience and whether or not at like how you would determine whether or not an AI has an experience or not. So right now, from what I know about the hard problem of consciousness, uh, and again, everything is provisional. What I say today may be irre irrelevant five years from now, but right now, what we know about uh, from the hard problem of consciousness the digital versions of ourselves will never have subjective conscious experience. Now you saw that Wall Street into a uh, question, what did you eat for breakfast? He says, I don't eat breakfast. You know, the machine doesn't eat breakfast and it doesn't get hungry either. It doesn't feel sexual either. It doesn't fear death either. So, you know, it is, it is a simulation for that reason. But what we're saying here, London, is a little more that you right now as a body mind are also a simulation, that also the world is a simulation, because what is it? It's the modification of consciousness into sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. That's all we experience, perceptions. We modulate that and we create models around that and they're very useful models. So I see this technology, the digital avatars interacting with each other, growing in knowledge, maybe even growing in wisdom, maybe even growing in creativity without the subjective fears and trials and tribulations of what we call human existential suffering, which is part of our play also, right? That the, the suicide uh, prevention bot is dealing, even though she's a machine, she's dealing with human existential suffering and what we are finding is that people are more comfortable talking to a machine than to a human being because they feel less vulnerable. So there are advantages, but it's not the whole story. Now, if you want to extend your imagination, and I hope Ken won't say this is, this is um, scary, but it's going to happen. It's, <laughs> technology is part of our evolution. So it's going to happen. We're going to seed distant planets, in ex exoplanets in different galaxies with human genetic information and biological genetic information of the planetary biome create biospheres in distant planets in different galaxies and seed the universe with human and animal and plant and bacterial life. And you can see the implications of this. You know, right now, with the COVID-19, all people are talking about is a vaccine, which is a very good idea. We need a vaccine. But actually, the, these mutations are, if in the deeper reality, they are a damaged, abused, inflamed ecosystem of genetic information through human interference. So, you know, we are 90 percent of our food is industrially produced with chemicals and hormones and antibiotics and petroleum products. 30 percent of the population in urban environments suffers from dysbiosis, which is now connected to chronic disease as well. So it's not only the planetary inflammation and human inflammation, the human body inflamed, but the planetary uh, inflammation which are connected because the biosphere outside your body, what we call the ecosystem, uh, the biosphere is the same as the biosphere inside your body. It's all made of the same stuff, which is earth, water, air, and space, objectively, but subjectively, sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, and perceptions. Marry the two. All right. That doesn't scare me, by the way. <laughs> that makes okay, me good. <laughs> Um, so Olivia is next, and then Daniela after Olivia. 
Uh, thank you so much for the great presentations. I have two questions, actually. Um, I'm really curious about the EEG and VR combination. And in my understanding, these sensors uh, that have a small number of like dry electrodes might not pick up the signals very clearly. Uh, I'd love to know what the biggest challenges are when obtaining these reliable signals for having a custom model for each user and, and how they were overcome. Yeah, that was a big challenge. So I think so we are working. I think uh, the inventor of this technology is Dr. Ricardo Gilda Costa is on the call on this particular chat line. If you want him to explain, I can do that. But what we are doing today, what we are saying is that this technology went from 16 to now wearable on the on the forehead. We, we, what, what we are saying is that don't use any just one sensor to extrapolate the data. Use multiple sensors to converge, right? So if you can look at my EEG data and my GSR and my heart rate variability, if it's correlating, yes, I know I'm stressed, I can then change this world. So the goal should be to kind of look at analytics to converge multiple sensors to interpret the data. But, but once again, technology is getting better as we speak. Heart rate variability is now, you know, I'm wearing the aura ring, which is there. We're not moving into stretchable electronics. I can wear a patch, it's on my shirt all the time, right? So I think it's going to get better. But the message here is that to create a model of multiple sensors to say, this is Olivia's baseline. Creating a baseline is important, right? Awesome. Good. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have another question that's a bit more whimsical, perhaps. Um, I came across this thing recently where somebody was teaching their dog to speak um, by having little buttons that the dog could use their paw to press and form sentences. So I'm wondering, obviously, it seems like pets don't have the same ambitions and behavior as humans do. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on what it could mean if we are able to teach pets to f form complete sentences. So Olivia, you know that dogs are a human creation. Uh, they, weren't, they didn't exist as part of our evolution. They were wolves at one time and we have created the whole uh, dog population of the entire world and we actually the reason dogs are good friends and so are cats is they're so domesticated that the limbic brains of humans and dogs can resonate even though we don't know what their experience is but you're right the technology can accelerate this deep learning and not only with dogs and uh, other uh, and domesticated animals but in my mind, at some point, interspecies communication. Wow. So you can communicate with a bird or an eagle. And this is where BCI is going. I think the whole brain computer interface is really moving in that direction. So that's a great question. That's your advanced assignment. You don't have to submit that before the end of the semester, but I want you to all start working on that. So Daniela, did you uh, did you take your hand down? Were your questions answered, or you, did you just acknowledge that I, I said you were going to go? No, actually, I had the same question than Olivia about the EEG, but now um, I'm wondering if it's already available and how accurate it is compared to a normal EEG cab. And so what I'm going to do, yeah, and what I'm going to do, Daniela, I'm going to actually work with Ken to share. Uh, we'll have, we actually curated all the contacts and information. So I'll work with Ken to make sure that's available to all of you all here. And our our neurotechnology right now, the partnership, uh, it's actually FDA approved already. On the gaming side, the, the gamification gaming. side is actually FDA clear brain assessment, yes. And uh, once again, the technology which came out of, for the neuroverse, it came out of the SOC Institute. Well, and I, I wanted to ask um, also if, have you um, thought about integrating also um, smell into VR experiences? Um, maybe you could take advantage then of like aromatherapy. Yeah, you, you could uh, program your uh, handheld device to emit your favorite smell while you're doing the exercises. So that would be easy. I think we've looked at for Alzheimer's, the sense of smell, and it's called reminiscent theory to basically work with Alzheimer's patient using reminiscent music and then smell. So that can be triggered. I think that's part of the conversation. By the way, that's a very interesting comment right now for Berkeley School of Music students, how to incorporate music, smell, hand movements, facial expressions, and a beautiful piece of music together into a biological response. So that's a great lead into for Alzheimer's. Especially for Alzheimer's, you know, because as you know, 
Alzheimer's people lose memory, but they don't lose music memory for some strange reason. So we have a Berkeley student with his hand up next, Pedro, and I, I believe he's also got Tibetan prayer flags in his background. Is that what that is, Pedro? Yes, it happens to be that. Um, Ken, do you think it would be appropriate for me to show some of my work? I would love to share it with you. With, um, with I'm just a little worried about time. We're in about three or four minutes, but if you want to send me something, I will forward it. Um, Deepak, we enjoy would it. And then we would love to interact with you. Nice. That sounds great because you mentioned gesture interaction, um, yeah. like uh, dynamic music systems, um, some brainwave work. And I, 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 have, I have one question. I have two questions about that. The first one, would be um, how you understand, because um, traditional cultures have been using music for a long while to facilitate the way, the, the path towards wisdom. And I wonder what are some thoughts on, on, on how music could be used on, on these types of systems in, with technology? It's, music is one of the most overlooked, um, but the most effective ways to treat all kinds of disorders, including not just mental disorders and emotional distress, but actually physical disorders. Because I, in my mind, and where we work, we don't use uh, mind and body as separate entities, just like space-time is one entity, mass energy is one entity, wave particle is one entity, body-mind is one entity. And the body has musical intelligence. We call the universe uh, the universe, and it's a very interesting word, universe, which means one song, one symphony. Now, our interest in, um, in music at uh, the Chopra Foundation, where we would love to collaborate with you, is on what we call biological rhythms. So circadian rhythms are one type of rhythm, but there's also seasonal rhythm as the earth goes around the sun. There's also lunar rhythm, as a result of the complicated gravitational effects on the Earth uh, through the movement, coordinated movements of Earth, Sun, and Moon. And finally, there are gravitational rhythms. So all these rhythms, when they are in sync with the human biological clocks, that would be called perfect health, would be called perfect health theoretically, because it would be the state of least entropy where your biological rhythms are in sync, in tune with universal music. So that's where we need to go ultimately. Music therapy, not only for treatment of mental and physical disorders, but for expansion of consciousness. And if we believe that the universe is, a, the, that we experience, not everybody, but as humans, we experience the universe, what we call natural laws, are nothing other than regularities of experience in our consciousness. So the more we can align with these natural laws through music therapies, adding, of course, now we know so much about synesthesia. There are people who hear a musical tune and they taste a strawberry or they taste a strawberry and it can, gets converted into music. So looking at the experiences of synesthesia, and I've been talking to some of these people, you know, people who in the past I would think were flakes, you know, but I'm at a neuroscience conference recently, I met a woman, she said, I communicate with birds. And I said, uh, wait a minute, you know, I was reluctant to talk to her till she told me she was a neuroscience student at the Karolinska Institute. And suddenly I changed my mind and I started to listen to her. And I realized that interspecies communication is also possible, possibly, through music therapy or music vibrations or regularities of resonance in nature. So music is has to be explored more than anything else right now. Music and math actually govern the universe. Just to add one more thing, Pedro. I will send this information later through Ken. We've been doing a lot of work with binaural beats, brain entrainment, photoic stimulation. So how do you use light and sound to entrain the brain to achieve what you call states of flow? So if you look at Tibetan throat singing, uh, you know, overtone singing. So we're able to now look and match and look at these different modalities of Eastern wisdom and then bring in technologies to do that. And we'll, we'll take it offline. It's a whole nother con work to do here. And by the way, Deepak and Punacha are very generous in offering to mentor you throughout not only the semester, but maybe in the next year, they have connections with all of these companies that are working on these things where you could do internships 
um, we're going to discuss a whole lot of ways for you to stay engaged once the semester is over. Um, so with that, we're going to change gears now, but please join me in giving a very warm 